recording now and then yeah so so before tomorrow's training i'll upload this video again to the same the same dropbox folder so if you follow that link you should be able to see how's it hi is that michael eh? yes i'm late sorry about that no no worries i was just i was just talking about you actually uh, you had a question yesterday about the source of the uh, where the auto update was coming from. I did put it into an email to you as well, but just uh, this is where it pulls the exchange rate from, this website here. And um, did you also, everyone who attended the training yesterday, did you receive a link in an email from our training lady, uh, Tasman? Yes, uh, regarding the uh, the film, the yes. video, the training video. Okay, yes, I did. Perfect. perfect. Quick question. Uh, I attended the, uh, so far I've attended all the training sessions. There was one the first day on installation of Palladium. Uh, do you know if that video uh, took place? And if it did, is it possible to get a, uh, a link to that one? Because uh, I always seem to have a little bit of difficulty working with the, uh, the port numbers and the, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the pipes and so on when I'm setting up the, the uh, SQL server. I, I always yeah. seem to run into a bit of trouble. Yeah, uh, as far as I believe, cause it wasn't myself who did the training. I believe it wasn't recorded. Um, I think he, okay. he, he did it at quite short notice. The person who's meant to be doing it was called off site. So it wasn't actually recorded. And, and that's the same. All right. Also, the same applies to the What's New in Version 10 training session. I think he probably attended as well. Right. Yeah. But the. the there is a video on our YouTube channel for the new features on version 10, uh, which I did back in November. So if you do, which covers everything that's in the brochure. Uh, so I'm just going to go in there quickly. I'm just going to put the link in the chat as well. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think if I go back a bit. Yeah, so you see here to the right hand side, there's a webinar on what's new in version 10 part 2. So it took me two hours. Excellent. It took me two hours to get through the brochure. So everything is there, really. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to dive straight into it. So it's uh, yesterday we did the general ledger, and today we're going to go into the accounts <laughs> module. Um, I see there's a few microphones on. If you don't mind, just turn them off, just for the sake of sound interference. If you if you have a question, you're more than free to turn it on and ask your question or pop your question to the chat. Okay, so yesterday we did the general ledger module, and today we're going to move on to the accounts receivable, and I believe it's scheduled accounts payable for tomorrow. So most of the setup for most areas is actually here. I bounced into this section a little bit yesterday, but we're doing a lot more today. In the control panel, you go to company options. So there's a lot of settings here to be set up before you work in the accounts receivable section, really. So I'm going to start here and just bounce between the two, the control panel, and counts receivable. Uh, actually, in hindsight, let's start off with creating a customer, I think is probably the best place to start. So I'm just going to minimize this chat on the left hand side. Let's just move this away. And let's do it. So most of these modules, so we have our inventory, accounts receivable, etc. But there's a there's a basic structure there that applies across the board. So at the bottom of each one, you can see maintenance. So this is just the things that you predefine. That these are the things you set up. They don't have any implications on stock or anything like that. It's creating your item master file, creating your customer, creating your vendors, creating categories. And then you get to use, utilize these predefined settings at the top of each module where your processing comes into play. So when you're doing invoicing, quotations, inventory will be adjust, adjustments and transfers, etc. So I'm going to start here with creating a customer first. So the, I'm on a sample company. So these, on this screen, you'll see all the customers that have already been set up. But if you want to create a new one, we just select, simply select new, and we're going to put in our code. So again, because of my lack of imagination, let's call it test 7 and uh, let's, let's name it after myself. Yeah, so on this first page, we just have basic contact information for this company. Let's just call it something more sensible. 
pensions. Okay, there's a microphone moving. I just ask you to turn off your microphone, Vincent, unless you have a question. Thank you. Yeah, so on, on this screen, you have all your basic information, as you can see. We have the street address, the suburb, the city, etc. So it, it's, it's quite monotonous and tedious to fill in this information, but this is information that's important, as this is what's going to show on the invoice form that you print out at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, so we have country, your VAT registration number, etc., phone number, and there we go. And then the email addresses. So you might have, you might send your invoices to this company to a different person than you send your customer statements to, and your orders and quotes. So if, in the case where you only you send everything to the same person, you can just put the email address in here. However, if you do send the, the invoicing and statements to different people at that organization, then you populate these fields. And then these, these email addresses here will override this one. Uh, just whilst I'm on this screen, so I'm just gonna, every time I notice something, I'm just going to explain what it is. So down here, you can see we have inactive customer. So all that is really, if, if there's a customer you have on the system that you no longer sell to for whatever reason, and you no longer want your users to be able to process invoices, quotes to that customer, you'll just tick this option and make them inactive. Again, as I, I stated yesterday, I'm running on a test version. Um, you'll see there's some new features. Uh, I think I know what this error is. It's because we haven't created the customer yet. So I'm, on, I'm running on a test version. So that's how you'd make a customer inactive or not. So I wouldn't be able to process against them. And then the next field here we have is contacts. So your primary contact you probably populate in these fields. And then if there's other people, you can just populate it in here. So. stick in Michael and then the job title so you can create a job title you can put in their information you can even link it to their Facebook and LinkedIn page if you wanted to do so uh, your shipping locations so this is um, so when you're doing a sales invoice or a sales order you'll pick at what location so when you jail so if you're this company has numerous branches uh, when you're doing the invoice or the order wherever it may be you need to choose which branch so this is where you predefine this. So you might have a jailbreak branch. I'm not going to populate all these fields, but you can, you can see the information it's asking for. And let's say Cape Town. And if you're not on version 10 yet, you'll note on this screen, you'll notice that distance is a new field here. So there's a new feature that's called delivery costs. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much depth about it. It's, it's covered in the, the warehousing module but that's where that derives from. So your delivery cost will be based on how the distance from your warehouse to the, the branch where you're delivering to, and it'll calculate uh, a delivery cost, basically. So I've set up two locations there, two shipping locations. Uh, settings. Uh, just, just whilst, uh, you know, another thing. So if you're familiar with Palladium, when you, do know, when you have a vendor, you're able to input the vendor item code because it's very rarely the case that the vendor or the customer's item code is the same as yours. So when you send them an invoice or a purchase invoice to your vendor or your customer, your item code on that form might not make much sense to them. So you might want, so your customer might prefer to see their own item code. So I'll just quickly show you. So on the customer side, that's a new feature that's coming out. But just, just so you know what's coming. So if I go to the vendor side, will be the flip of this really. So I'm just going into a vendor, we have item pricing. And here we can select an item. It comes up, here we go. Hi, Abdurrahman. Uh, I can see your message in the chat. Is anyone else having an issue with the sound? Uh, 
Can everyone hear me okay? Great job, glad to hear it. Um, uh, uh, forgive my pronunciation, Abdurrahman. Um, maybe log out of the webinar and then log back in. I know that's helped in the past with other users. Great, thanks for the feedback, everyone. Uh, yeah, so on the purchasing side, so you can see here, I'm linking a, an item to this supplier. And I can in, so here's my part number, but I can input the, the part number of the vendor. So when I do a purchase invoice, it will show their part number and not mine. So the reason I'm showing that is because this has also been extended onto the customer side. So it's not available in this version, but it, it just so you know what's, what will be available soon. So let's go back into my customer. Uh, partially set up here, yeah, paint shop. So the next section is settings. So you can see this page is quite busy. So this is where most of your settings are applied. So at the top here, you see we have credit control. So if, you, if, if we tick this option, it means that this customer has a credit control limit. And that value is 100,000. So this, this is predefined. So when I create a new customer, it's already defaulted to 100,000. That's because of a setting in the control panel. So I'm just going to bounce out again. Like I said, I'm just going to bounce in between the control panel accounts receivable quite a lot. So I'm coming in here, company options, accounts receivable. And then down here somewhere here, default credit control for new customers. So that's where it's got the 100,000 for. So it's just a default, but when you create a customer, you can, you can change it. But if you have a standard credit control of, let's say, 5,000, you're better off to change it here. Uh, just going through all the questions in the chats. Vincent, yeah, you have an issue. Vincent, maybe log out to the webinar and log back in. Uh, Karen, can you set up the accounts to be 45 days? Are you talking about the, the terms? Yes, no, you, you absolutely can do so. Yeah. So let's go straight into there. So again, in the control panel, you'll find those type of settings, Karen. So if I, where is it here? So terms is here. So working on my sample company, these are the two default ones that, that come through. But we can simply create a new one and we'll call it... 45 days from invoice. And we're going to apply it to both receivables and payables. And so here's the, so we just simply change that to 45. And we'll do it from statement, uh, from invoice. You can do it from statements as well. So let's click there. So then if we do an invoice after 45 days, it'll become overdue. Is, is, does that address your question, Karen? So now I'm going back into the, thanks Karen. So if I go back into the settings under payment terms, you'll see it's added that one on now, 40 days from invoice. So you can do whatever terms you want really. It's based on that, that setting where you put in the number of days. So it's from invoice or from statement. Um, yeah, so just going back to the credit control. So it defaulted to 100,000, but because I changed that setting in the options now, next time I create a customer, it will default to 5,000. Uh, other settings here, we have the interest rates. Again, this is predefined by the setup. I can, I can change it here, I have the flexibility, but the default is pulling from the options. I'm not, I'm not going to go back in there right now, but it is just below the credit control. We'll, we'll go back in there later to show you where it's coming from. Um, if for whatever reason that you decide that you're putting the client on credit hold, even if they haven't gone over this limit, you'll simply come into the customer and just tick this option. So then you can no longer process against this custom until this option is turned off. Uh, yeah, so we have our payment terms here, uh, which we just set up for Karen. And here we have our default tender type. Uh, category. Uh, yeah, so you, you can set, segment your customers into various categories, basically. Maybe it's... Uh, it's from the retail, you maybe may do it by industry or something like that. Maybe they're in the retail industry or 
whatever it may be. So whatever category suits you. So if you might, you might have, you might break it down into regions. It's entirely up to you. Exactly, Michael. Yeah. Uh, so on accounts, so this is just a default. So when we do a sales invoice against this customer, it'll go on accounts. If we do EFT, it'll, it, you can you can set it up so it does an auto cash payment, it auto receipts it. Because if you're doing an invoice for cash, you might want to receipt it straight away as you're receiving that cash COD. But by default, it's on account. I'm just reading your question, Michael, because you can set customer records as inactive but are subject to mailers and marketing. Just trying to think of the appropriate answer. Uh, can you elaborate a bit, Michael? You know, you know, are you saying create the in, uh, the ones you're making active to a different category, or? Uh, yes. Uh, what I meant by that is, you know, you could technically upload, let's say, a marketing database. You could buy a database from, uh, you know, a marketing company with uh, ten thousand uh, records, mark them all inactive, have that info in the system, do your marketing, and when these triggers hit, you just turn them from inactive to active, so you don't have to enter the customer uh, second time. So you can sort of keep your whole yeah. uh, uh, population of customers, contacts, and prospects in the same database. Yeah, that, that makes That's sense. just a thought. No, no, it's an interesting thought. It's not something I've heard about, but absolutely, you could absolutely do that. So, you, so, there is okay. a, so there's an import function, as you probably know, for most. So we can import a 1,000 customers, as you say, from a database. Um, you could, there's a field there for inactive. And if you put true, it would make them all inactive. So you won't be able to process against them until they show their interest. And then you get, at that time you could switch it back on so you can process against them. I think we're on the same page now. Uh, Bryn, if you tick credits on hold, will that stop invoice being processed? Yeah, that'll stop, that'll stop all users from being able to process an invoice against them if it's on credit hold. So if this is on credit hold, no users can process. If this is unticked and we use the credit control, uh, so the super users, as some, some of our clients call it, can authorize to go above the credit limits. But maybe, so you'd have to make sure the user security is set correctly. But yes, Bryn, so if this is tick, no one can process against the customer. And you'd have to get one of the, the, the system administrators to either untick this or explain why it is ticked. Um, over here, so we have invoice document form. So, as you know, so when you do an invoice, you know, like we can customize forms for you based on your specifications. So, in some of our clients, so you can actually link a specific form to specific customers. So it's it's rarely done, but we have one client who has customers in France. So they would actually link them to a different form where all the writing is actually in French and not in English. So, I mean, you could do it if you had Afrikaans or whatever people you could have, you could link them to as a specialized form. So that's all that is. And the same applies to orders. Uh, here is the home currency. So again, as I explained yesterday and demonstrated a little bit, you can, you can set up uh, foreign customers. Uh, we have a default salesperson. So let's show you where that's created. So at the moment, I don't have any there. So that means when as soon as we do an invoice against this customer, it will select the default salesperson. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, sure. So all that is is if they say the client, so the credit limit is 100,000 Rand, and let's say they're on, currently they're on 99,000. So we only have 1,000 Rand spare to play with. So... If there's a, we're going to do a sales or a sales invoice, but it's maybe it's 1,200, and we want to make an exception in this case, we can just put a temporary limit of 1,200. So that will mean we can go and do that invoice for 1,200. And you can actually put an expiry date on that also. 
So if we don't make use of this extra 1,200 by the 7th of March, it will go back down to the original value. I hope that helps with that. Um, yeah, so salesperson, I just want to show you where you create the salesperson briefly as well. Uh, if we come down here, so again, in the, under the maintenance section, we have our salesperson. Okay, sorry, I just got a, a little written message that someone's struggling with audio. Is everyone else okay with the audio at the moment? Just one of my colleagues are trying to listen in on the train, they're having an issue, so I'm not too worried about him, as long as you guys can all hear. Everyone fine with the, the sound still? Perfect, great. And my colleague can watch the, the video recording then. Yeah, so he, here's where we set up the, the salesperson. So let's go create new, and I've got one of our resellers sitting in with the training with me, so I'm going to call after him, Paul Harst. I think it's actually De Harst, eh? Mm. Uh, so you can put his information here. So I've now set up a salesperson as simple as that. So I'm going to go back into my customer, and under settings, here his name applies. So now when I do an invoice for this customer, it will default to that salesperson. So I just want to make sure the right settings here. So again, I've gone back to the company options and there's a setting here somewhere. It's quite busy here. So we have default salesperson. So at the moment it's determined by the customer. So that goes with the example I was saying. So we'll, we'll go do an invoice for that customer now and I'll show you how we'll use Paul as the default salesperson. But if you want the salesperson to be determined by the actual user who's logging in, so such as Nishan who's just written in, in the comments. So if Nishan has, let, well, let's go show you exactly what I mean. So I'm going to go to users. I don't have a user set up, so I'm going to create a user. And then here, and a default salesperson. So depending on that setting you have in the options, that's where the system's going to look. It's either going to look at the user who's logged in or the customer you're invoicing, depending on that setting. So if I now go to accounts receivable, and let's select our customer. You can see straight away down here, it's populated the field of Paul. So it's just a default. Again, on the, on the document itself, you do have the flexibility of selecting another salesperson. Um, essentially, the user is the inside sales rep. Um, not necessarily. I mean, a lot of, our, like, a lot of people have uh, sales reps are always on the road, and they don't use Palladium. They'll be just uh, doing quotations and whatnot, but they won't do it themselves. They'll ask one of the users to do it. Because someone might have 30 sales reps around the country, but they don't want to have 30 users on the system. They don't want to have to pay for those. Uh, so they wouldn't be set up as a user. They'd just be set up as a, a salesperson. There was a client I was at uh, last week, and they had 15 sales reps, but none of them were actually on the system itself as a user. So it, with, essentially with your question, Michael, so if you were set up as a user, and you'd, you'd also have to be set up as a salesperson as well. They're not necessarily the same thing, if that makes sense. So if you, you're a user and a salesperson, you'd, you'd be set up twice in both areas. Great, perfect. Thanks for the question, Michael. Uh, let's go back into settings. Yeah, so we've got Paul de Haast here, we've got a currency. Uh, and then we've got categories. So again, we only have the one set up. I'll show you where we set that up now. And you can also link customers to various price lists. So the price list is, is another comprehensive feature. It's, it's been enhanced quite significantly as well in version 10. So we'll cover that tomorrow. Actually, I think it might be on Monday we're doing inventory. So we'll cover that then. And then over here we have the trade discount. So if I put in 15% here, all that means is when I do an invoice uh, invoice against this customer, it will apply a 15% discount to that document straight away. So again, let's just put that into practice. So if I go and back in sales invoice, select the customer, 
hidden behind the chat here, you can see it's applied a 15% discount straight away. Uh, let's go back into our settings. So that's where this pulls from. Uh, we can link profit centers. So that's something we covered yesterday in the, the general ledger module. So we have our two set up here, the sample company. So if you're interested in finding out more about what the profit center is, I, I don't want to bore those who were here yesterday. So um, you can use that link that I provided earlier and go back and watch that video. Uh, we also have departments. So it can be used for various things really. So so I know internally on our side, I'm part of the support team. So whenever I do an invoice for wherever it may be, uh, one of these departments will be called support. So it just means the managers and that can pull reports uh, to see where the most invoicing is coming from and whatnot. But it doesn't have to be uh, a department necessarily like support, marketing, or sales. Uh, a client I was at yesterday uh, used department for their branches. So they had Cape Town, Joburg, and Durban. And as I mentioned yesterday, you can you can run income statements, trial balances by department. So again, that, that's covered a bit more in the video from yesterday if you're interested in finding out more about that. The matrix type, uh, that's a that's a discount uh, setup. So we'll cover that. I think actually it might fall into the, the inventory module. Actually, there's one here, so we'll cover that shortly. Uh, okay, so that's here. Uh, contract pricing, that falls under the inventory category. That's another discount uh, thing we can have set up, which will be covered on Monday. But this is where you'd link it to your customer, the master file. And then other things here, so create customer invoice methods. So what this means is so if I have this unticked, it means that I can't generate uh, an invoice directly for this customer. It has to come from a sales order. So it just allows you to put some sort of workflow into your organization. So I know I always refer to my clients, but they always give me the best practical examples. So I know, I know we, we set them up last week during the implementation, and all of their invoicing should have come through sales orders. But I got contact and said, well, for some reason, there's no sales order for this. And it's because of this setting, really. So it allowed users to process invoices directly. So they've sub subsequently come into the master file and changed this. Again, you can change all these settings with an invent, uh, customer import export and make these changes in bulk to all your customers in one go. So now I've unticked this option. Uh, if I go into the sales invoice and we look for our customer, you can see that company, that customer I just set up, is not showing in the list. So it's called the paint shop. It wasn't this one. So I can't invoice it. So I would have to do a sales order first and then come and convert it here. This will show me all my open quotes and orders. So that's where I'd have to convert it. So if I now go back to my customer. So I'm just going to turn this off because I might want to use this customer again for later. I don't want to be puzzled why the customer isn't showing. Uh, it's, it's, it's also because as a work in support, it's quite a common query. We get Some users are saying they can see this customer and some saying they can't. can't. So it's usually because of settings like this in the master file. Uh, also over here we have back orders so all this means is so we do a sales order for a quantity of 10 of item A and then when we do the sales invoice let's say we do five so if I have on allow it'll mean there'll be an open quantity on the sales order if we have a warning it'll, it'll exactly that will give us a warning saying this is going to be short delivered are you happy with having an open quantity, a back order for this, this item? And if we have cancel, it won't allow a back order. So we'll have the sales order of 10, we'll do the sales invoice for five, and then there won't be an open quantity on the sales order. It'll close the sales order, order automatically. So I'll just again, I'll just show you what I mean. So I'm gonna just leave it, let's put it on allow, shall we? And let's go do a sales order. Paint shop, select our inventory item, 
And we'll just use the example I did now. So let's say 10 items, 100 rand. And we'll record. So now when I go to a sales invoice, instead of selecting the customer here, because we're not doing it, we're going to just convert the order that I've created. So I come to convert, select here, and let's say we're doing it for five. And see, it's coming up with this warning message now. Do you wish to allow a back order for short delivery quantity for inventory item right now? So if I selected the, the option where it just said allow, then we wouldn't even get this warning message. So this is just letting us know, and it gives you the option to proceed, yes or no. So I'm going to select yes. So now we've invoiced and we've allowed for a back order. So now if I go back to the sales order, if you want to see your open sales order, you just come here. And you can see there's a new field here for open quantity. So we can now go and convert the rest of it to an invoice if we wanted to. Uh, hi, Brent. Uh, sorry, I don't know if you tick the credit on hold. Can you still create a purchase order? Uh, do you mean a sales order, rather? Because we're focusing on the sales side. Uh, if so, uh, so let me show you something. Uh, let's have a look. So if it's on hold, if you're talking about ticking that option again, uh, let, well, let's put it to a test. I don't think it will allow us, but there's a similar function here. So I just want to show you this first. I'm just going back to options and then receivables. Down here, credit block on overdue invoices and credit block on over credit limits. So there's two slight variations of similar things here. But down here, you see one's for sales invoice processing. And then down here we have for sales order processing. But this is only applying to the credit limits, but you're referring if we tick that box. So let's go and tick that box for uh, this customer. Let's put them on credit hold. And so it won't allow us to do an invoice. Yeah, there we go. Well, there, there's your answer, Brim. No problem. So I'm just going to put, turn that setting off. Yeah, where was I? Customer. Yes, I think. Oh yeah, back orders. So I'm just going to allow for that. And what else do we have on here? Uh, the delivery method. Uh, so again, that's something that's covered in the warehousing module, that's to do our delivery costs and so forth. So I'm not, I'm not going to cover that too much, but that will be covered on the warehousing module. Up here, um, the RST, the Remote Sales Terminal, uh, it's, it's another, it's, it's Palladium again, it, it looks the same, the interface is exactly the same. So you can just do sales quotes and sales invoicing on there, uh, not invoicing, sales quotes and sales orders. But what's quite handy about the remote sales terminal is it can work in an offline state. So you can do your orders for the day and quotes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then at the end of the day you can you might get an internet connection and link it to your server and you can update it. And then it'll update the live system. So it's quite handy if you have branches in remote areas with unreliable internet connections and so forth. It's quite useful then. So all the, all this means here is so you might have remote sales terminal, you might have them in three different locations, it might be in the same building. So if you have three remote sales terminals, uh, if I just put one in here, it means the person using remote sales terminal one can quote and order this customer, whereas two and three won't be able to, unless I input those machines here. So if you'd like to find out more about the remote sales terminal, just pop us an email after training. Uh, maybe maybe it's not a bad idea to set up a separate training session for that uh, that program. Mm. So I'm just going to, just whilst I'm mentioning that, I'm just going to pop in our support email address and my own. Yeah, Michael, I agree. I think it's I think maybe it's something we should do. I'm just going to make a note of that. Uh, training on RST. Perfect. 
so here we have our default tax code, exemptions, history. So this is for new customers, uh, new clients. If you're coming on to Palladium, you can bring in your history. So you can either bring in the history one by one, doing it here, but there's also a bulk import. So I'm not too sure why you'd go for this option. I mean, if you only have a couple of invoices to do, maybe this will be the easier option. But as I believe most of you are on Palladium already, you don't really have to worry about this screen at all. Uh, optional fields. Uh, clients, it gives you a lot of flexibility. So basically, if there's information on a customer that there isn't an appropriate field for on these other pages, on these other tabs, you can basically use these fields for that information. So, for, for instance, another client, in terms of reporting, they wanted to know what was the source of their customers. Is it, is it from uh, Michael? Let me have a look at your question quickly. I would like to see how you can set up various types of optional fields, specifically the drop-down selections. Perfect, yeah. So, like I was saying, so the optional fields, like the clients, I was at recently wanted to know the source of their clients, where are they all coming from? Is it word of mouth? Is it from, how did they hear about them, basically? Newsletters or... Uh, referral or something like that and then when we we created a custom report for them uh, so it showed graphs of where most of your customers are coming from so so we can actually change these names so it's field 1 to 12 it's, it doesn't make much sense but we, we actually have the flexibility in Palladium of changing these names so if I come to the control panel company options and let's have a look here Da -da -da. It's one of these columns. Here it is. So we have receivable. So I'm going to change this and say, I'm just going to call it source for now. Uh, is this by by customer or global? Uh, so you mean by changing the name? So that, that's a that's a global setting. And yeah, and also here, so I'm changing it to source. If we t if we tick it as mandatory, all that means is every time we create a new customer, this field has to be populated. It'll block you otherwise. If it's unticked, it means we can create a customer without selecting the source. So, I mean, in the case of our example here, it's it should be mandatory, really. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose. We want to know the source of every single customer. So, I'm going to tick that option. Hi, on, sir. Do you have a question? Do you mind if I turn off your microphone unless you have a question? Okay, I've turned it off. If you do have a question, you're free to turn it back on. So I'm just going back into the customer pain shop. And where were we now? Here we go. So I'm optional field. So you can see the names now change from field one to source. So now we can put in whatever information we want here. So word of mouth is going to be my example. So this customer came from that document. So we can do the same with all these fields, basically. And uh, another client I was at, we were using 10 of the 12. I was amazed that clients can use that many of these 12. I thought 12 was too many, but some clients do manage to use all these optional fields. Uh, targets. So you can set targets for your customers. You can do it per month, or you can allocate across 12 months like that. Trends, this just shows us a basic uh, a graphical visualization of, uh, hi Michael, can these be preset? Uh, that, that, that's the second half of your question, hey, the drop downs. So, so the, the drop downs, we also have optional fields in the inventory master file, vendor master file, and also it's also on invoicing as well. And the drop down functionality is available on invoicing and quotations and stuff like that, but it doesn't carry across here for some reason, um, perhaps it should do, really. Um, we do have an email address that's called uh, wishlist at palladium.coza. So if you ever have a suggestion that you think will enhance the program, we do, we do, do if, if there's a feature that's very specific to your organization and wouldn't be much use to other customers, um, then we can we can quote you for that development. So we can always do whatever development you require. But if it's a feature perhaps that you think will add great value to the system, then I advise that you send it through to this email address. 
I mean, our, our MD uh, gets these emails, so you're speaking to the person you'd want to speak to. So he'll go through them. If he sees they'll add great value, he'll put it on the development queue. So unfortunately at the moment, Michael, there isn't a drop-down functionality in the option fields here. So again, here's the targets, or trends, and here we can attach files. Uh, so you can just simply add any file, so you can add whatever you may like. Um, so here we have the trade discount of 15%. Maybe there's a contractual agreement for that, so you could upload the contract here. So you don't have to keep the physical hard copy in your office somewhere. You can upload it here. No, yeah, people love the attached files function. Clients, clients do love it. It seems like such a basic feature, but the clients do love it. So especially, so you can attach files to everything, to invoices, GRVs, etc. Because I know a client I was at recently, they attached all their PODs to their GRVs. And it saved them a lot of time internally because they'd have their colleagues asking them, have you got this, have you got this POD? But instead, it'll just be uploaded to the system and everyone can access it. Yeah, PDF drawings, you could, you could absolutely add in there, yeah. Notes, uh, this is basically just a blank canvas. You can put any information here that you may wish. There's no, there's no restraints. I'm not sure what the character limit is, but I imagine it's fairly unlimited. Uh, here we have linked customers. So again, another another client I was at last week. Uh, so they one of their customers was a major retailer. Uh, I'm not going to say which one, but like some like Pick and Pay. So obviously Pick and Pay would have their head office, and they would have all their the branches, their sub accounts. So let's pretend for a second this is pick and pay head office. And we're going to add, so I'm not going to go and change the names of these ones, but if you just imagine these are sub accounts or branches of pick and pay. So I'm selecting these four. So here, national account statement print method. So with individual, that means I can invoice all of these sub accounts and the head offices individually and I can go allocate payments receipts against them as well. And also when I would do a customer statement, it will do them individually. However, if we change this option to consolidated head office, that means when it means I can still invoice these ones individually, uh, but it will give us the option when we do a customer statement for the head office. There's an option where you can print the statements that combines all of the outstanding invoices from all the sub-branches that we've selected here. And also, in terms of receipting, we can just receipt the head office for the invoices that have been processed against all the sub-accounts. So it's a very useful feature again. Uh, so that's how you create a customer. I'm just going to call it back to the name I had previously, otherwise I'm going to get confused later down. I can see it. And tick. So we've created our first customer. And it only took us 50 minutes to do so. It took surprisingly long. Um, so here we have salespeople, uh, which we did quickly. We set Paul de Haast as a salesperson, just quickly bouncing here. You can see we have basic information again. You can set targets for your salesperson. Uh, so I can put that in here. Uh, trends, we can attach files. And then the targets, there's, a, there's actually a nice report where you can compare sales to their targets. So we'll go through the reports towards the end once we've got through most of the most of the features on here. Uh, we also have customer categories. So you can set them up. So it might be retail. And what's also nice, it has, uh, has a security. So you, you link the customer to the customer category. But if you enable, it's a shame I haven't got a user set up at the moment, so you might only want some of your users to be able to process against some um, customers belonging to certain categories. I don't think I'm articulating it well. So the, the paint shop custom I did, let's go link it to this category. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, paint shop. 
Shipping. Oh, Category. So retail. So you come back to categories, come in here, and security. So on the left hand side here, if we enable category security, we'd have a list of all our users. But in this sample company, I have no users set up. So let's say we have myself there and we have Michael there. So we can add myself, so that means I can invoice a paint shop because they fall into this category. Whereas Michael, no access, won't be able to invoice or do a sales order or quote the customers belonging into this category. If you'd like me to do a practical example and set up a couple of customers, I'm more than happy to do so, just, just let me know. That, that's what that functionality does. Um, discounts, so there's, there's various discounts, things we can set up here. There's one here and there's two in the inventory, one here and one here, which we'll cover when we get to the inventory module on Tuesday. But since this one falls under here, we'll just cover it briefly now. Um, so we'll go into here, create new, and discount January, wherever it may be. We select new. So you can, you can see everything we can do on here. So we can apply a date. So you can apply for, if you're running specials in two months' time, you can set a date range. You can predefine it. So this one's going to be from the 1st of February to the 29th of February. And then you can choose here. So value 10 rand to 1,000 rand. And I'm going to put 25% here. And from 1,000 rand to 2,000 rand, 50%. So what I've set up there actually means, so items that are valued between 10 and 1,000 rounds will get a 25% discount if they're purchased within this date range. And items valued between 1,000 and 2,000 rounds will get a 50% discount, again, if it's in this date range. However, if there's certain items that fall within these uh, price ranges that you want to be excluded, you can just come here. So by default, it includes everything. But if there's a couple here that you want to extract, you can come and press exclude, and they'll move across here. So that's how you set up this one. Uh, the one in the inventory module is very, very similar, except uh, so this one purely looks at the value, looks at price, whereas the one in the inventory module has an extra column here for category. So it'll be items that belong between 10 and 1,000 rand that belong to category A of inventory category that is. So most clients use that one really, but they do basically the same thing, with the exception that the one that caters for item categories. And again, this is linked in the customer master file under the settings tab. Um, so I think we can finally get through, let's do some processing now. So we've got our customers and our salespeople set up. Uh, let's have a look. Let's go back to the control panel and look at the company options. Important not to miss anything. Okay, so I'm working on the receivables module today, but you can see there's tasks for payables, general ledger, warehousing, manufacturing. But for receivables, here's just some basic settings. So when we run our age analysis, it, it defaults to you know the most popular one, 30, 60, 90 days. But for whatever reason, if you use a different uh, aging, you can just change it here, and it'll adjust the report accordingly. accordingly. Uh, reference number checking. So all this means is uh, when you do a sales order or a sales invoice, you'll see that there's a reference field there. So if you use the, sale, the same reference more than once, with this setting here, it will give you a warning. And here it will give you an error, meaning you can't process until you use a unique reference number. So uh, it's also quite handy, this one, especially with credit notes, because you, you can credit the same invoice more than once. So when you do a credit note, it automatically uses the invoice number as a reference. So if you want to know if you're about to credit the same invoice more than once, then you, you can turn on one of these settings. So you'll put warning. And then you, when you get the warning that you're sending you using the same reference number, it's more than likely that you've already done a credit note for that invoice. Uh, default department. So again, we covered that like um, before. So like going back to my own example, being part of the support team, when I do a sales order, a sales quote, it always defaults to the support department. 
So you can have this as either determined by the customer, who I'm doing a quotation for, or by the person who's logging in. So in my case, it's determined by me when I log into Palladium. Every transaction I do defaults to the support department. So I'll just show you what that is. So under users, it's in the same place where we set the default salesperson. So we also have default location, default warehouse, whatever you want to call it. And here we have default department. So let's say this one's for support. And we'll go back in here. And so, yeah, so that's what that is. Uh, blank department. Uh, so again, going back to the clients I was at, so uh, they use departments for Joburg Warehouse, Cape Town, and Durban. So it was important to them in terms of their financial reporting for them to be accurate. They didn't want to allow people to process invoices or sales orders with no de department allocated. So they have this setting block. So it means we can't do an invoice or wherever it may be with a blank department. So I'll just show you now, if I go to an invoice here, and we'll select a customer, you'll see department's none at the moment. So I'm going to select my item, stick in a price there. Uh, it comes up with this message, your system administrator has determined that department cannot be left blank. Please select the appropriate department and try again. So then the user knows, well, it should default to whatever the user has been set up, but if they haven't been set up correctly, then click department and we can try again. And that's recorded. So you can see really the company options in the control panels are probably the best place to start. Just make sure everything's set up correctly. Uh, create a credit note. So on Palladium, it's, it's, you, can, you can do a credit note directly on the invoice or you can use a credit note icon. So I'll just show you what I'm referring to there. So go to receivables. So you can see we have this credit note icon here. So we can come in here and we can open our invoices. So I can tick one and it's doing a credit note. It's reversing the quantity, et cetera, et cetera. And I can record it. So you can do it there or even on the sales invoice screen. You can do it directly here. So if I go to my previous one, you'll see this icon here, credit. So just a click of a button it's processing a credit note. Now I can record it. Uh, any questions at this stage? Michael, you've been unusually quiet as well. Uh, I'm starting to think no one can hear me. You can all hear me still okay, yeah? Perfect. Thanks again, Brent. Okay. So that's that section. And then blank credit note reason. So you see I did a credit note just now and I didn't apply a reason to it. So I'll show you again. So if I come up here, accounts receivable, invoicing, I'm going to go to a previous one again. And we're going to hit credit. So as soon as I hit credit, you'll see this new field populated down here. And it's blank. So because that setting it allowed me to do that. And so I should be able to select the reason. So there's none here at the moment. We can set these up here in the control panel under reason codes, credit note. So why are you doing a credit note? Maybe it's because of damaged goods. So then when I do the credit note, I can select that reason and then users can run reports to see why credit notes being passed. Perhaps there's a, there's a specific pattern of reasons that is avoidable to prevent less credit notes going forward. Uh, what else do we have over here? Uh, so customer VAT number. This is a common question that we get, especially from new, new clients. So they'll do invoices and they'll instantly uh, ask, why isn't the customer VAT number showing on the invoices? And it's because this defaults to be an unticked. So as soon as you tick this, then going forward, the customer VAT number will show on every invoice. And for whatever reason, if you only want the VAT number to show on invoices with a document value above a thousand, then you put in that setting. If you don't want it to show below that value, it won't with that setting in place. Uh, 
blank authorization codes. So it's similar to blank credit notes. Um, so all that is, is so you know in Palladium you can adjust documents, right? So only if you use the security setup the way it probably should be, some users won't be able to adjust documents. And if they select the adjust button, it'll come up with a screen of the, the system administrators. And they'll authorize why they're trying to adjust it. So the user will tell them, well, I've made a capture error, I put in the wrong quantity, maybe the price isn't right, or we promise this customer a discount. So you'd set up all these predefined reason codes. Uh, again, I, if you want me to show you that in a practical example, I'm happy to do so. I'm just quite time conscious. Of, um, I don't feel like I've got through much and an hour's gone flown past already, but we can go through all these things. Uh, default salespersons, I did touch upon that a bit earlier. Uh, so we set up the default salesperson by user, we said before. So again, that's in the same place as where we set the default department. Uh, blank salesperson, so it works in the same way, as, same way as these ones up here, so like blank department, blank credit notes, etc. So it means we can do a sales invoice with no allocated salesperson with this setting. If it sets a block, we'll get that same example that we saw before when we tried processing with blocking the department. And again, it's quite a nice report for that, like if, if every invoice should be linked to a salesperson, there is a report here if there is a report here, a missing salesperson. So this will give you a, uh, a report on all the invoices where the salesperson hasn't been selected. Uh, blank salesperson, sales processing. Uh, another nice feature here is so salesperson processing. So you can do either document level or line level. So if, well, let's put it in an example. So I'm going to take line level now. I'm going to go receivables. And let's select the customer. And I'm going to select a couple of items. Yeah. What items do you have up here? So I'm going to, so a nice little thing people don't realize. So most of the time you'll click on one item and you have to quite tediously click on the next one and then come and click on the next one. But there's also this option up here. That's because I have single select on. So you can change this to multiple select and click a few things at the same time. We can change the quantity down here. And then it, it pulls through that information here. I just want to minimize the chart over here. It's in the way of it. So here's the salesperson in the whole document. But if we want to do it line level, you can see we have it here. So maybe Paul was made the sale for the service call, but then we only have him set up, but if we had another one here, we'd be able to say, well, myself, Adam, did the engineering consulting work. So you can do it per line, and then you can run the sales reports that will pull through the relevant information from each sales invoice. It's, it's quite a nice feature. Um, okay, so that's over there. We have blank reference number. So again, it follows the same principle as blank salesperson, etc. So if your reference field has to be populated, you'd apply block. If you just simply want a warning, you put in that option. Uh, so this section here, I briefly addressed it very briefly with the Brinza uh, question. So we have credit block on overdue invoices and credit block on over credit limits. So at a glance, it looks like the same thing. Like a couple of people say, what's the difference between these things? Is it a system error? Have they designed and they just done a duplication of the same thing? Well, there's a, there's a subtle difference. I mean, so the credit block on overdue invoices, so if we put block here, uh, this means that, again, where we credit limits here. So the, if we go over the credit limits here, at the moment, the credit limit's just there as a reference point. But if we apply a block, then we won't be able to go over it. So this is if, if we just go over it. But if you want to ignore the credit limit and just see that the client's going to go over it, but you do want to implement the credit limits if their account's overdue, then you apply a block. And the same applies to the sales order level down here as well. 
So this is credit, if they're over the credit limit regardless, if they only went over the limit as of yesterday, but this is if they have overdue invoices. Over here we have the default credit controls we touched upon a bit earlier. So this is our new default when we create a new customer. Interest method, when we create that customer, you'll remember it defaulted to 22, so we can change this going forward when we create a new customer, it'll be 24. And then there's some more settings on this screen as well. So some uh, free and quotes, we, we're going to cover that now. Uh, what's we got here? Customer account number coding convention. So when I created my, um, my customer, I had it in free format, so I could have typed in any old rubbish. But if you follow a certain sequence or, or it has to be alpha numeric, so it might have to be two alpha digits and two numeric, it means I can't create a new customer without following this pattern. Uh, GP display on use sales form. So your GP, you have a choice of what you want it to be based on. So you can either be based on standard cost, uh, this will be, let me, sh I can show you quickly, it's in the inventory module, so let's just go there quickly. Inventory item. Uh, da -da -da. Item summary. So here you can see standard cost. So you'd populate this field if you want your GP to be always based on this predefined cost for this item. So just, just so you know where it's coming from. Uh, let's go Back in here, in uh, receivables, settings too. Uh, or if you want it to be based on your last receive cost. So that's your very last purchase price. That's what your GP would be based on if you select that option. And your moving average cost is exactly that. Uh, your GP would be based on exactly that, the, the average cost over time. Or you can choose for the GP to be based on the greater of the two of them. And again, this can be at company level. Or you can do it per location, because the unit cost in one of your branches might be higher to other ones, depending on uh, your purchase invoice pricing. Uh, so we have other features here. So we have a delivery advice, which is basically just the opposite to a GRV. So it's when you're physically delivering the goods. Uh, this, was, this was custom developed for one of our clients. I don't see many customers using it, so if I do activate it, You'll see a new icon appears, so it's popular. It's asking for a linked account, so I just need a link account to it. Uh, so all these things need to be activated. One, three, two, five. So I do, what it means is, is because there's a journal code, so you can't have a, a journal code with a linked account. So because I selected a random account, it's not allowing me to do so. So the quicker way would probably be for me to go delete the journal code. So uh, should I do it now? Let's do it now. 1,100, so I'm going to cancel that. I'm going to delete the journal code, 1,100. So if you, if you want to know what a journal code is, it's quite a powerful feature. Again, it was covered in a lot more detail yesterday in the, so I'll revert back to that video if you want to know what it's for. Um, it's Go back and try it again. Okay, great. So now if I go to receivables, you'll see this icon's now appeared. So you can go from order, convert that to delivery advice, and then convert that to a sales invoice. So it's just the opposite to a GRV, really. Uh, we have some other basic settings here. Uh, let's show you. Okay, so if I change that there, the, the small set of things, it's just preference of how you work, really. So before, when I selected an item, it, it, it stayed on this previous page. I could change the quantity and discount, but you can see now it's bringing up this screen straight away. And only at the end, I press cancel, then I can make the changes to price, discount, etc. So it's a small, small setting. Uh, 
briefly glance at these ones. Uh, so we have some general settings. So if your customer is uh, a cash account, so when you do an invoice and the payment method is cash, it will auto receipt. If you don't want that to be in place, you can just untick this option. Uh, block invoice entry to session date. So when you do a sale, when you do any processing documents, you can you can backdate your transaction. So a, a client I was again a, a client I was at recently didn't want their users everything should be captured on that day, and they wanted to control for that. They didn't see a reason why people should be backdating. So they had this setting in place. So if I go to a sales invoice, see here I can't change the day. Uh, I think let's get into some of the processing now. We've still got this whole top off to get through. So uh, let's let's start with the quotations and then go into orders and invoices, etc. So a common question we get is what what's the difference between a sales quote and a freehand quote? So I mean, at a basic level, effectively, the, the, they're both the same thing. You're generating a sales quote for the client. However, in terms of functionality. The free hand quote gives you a bit more flexibility. Hi, Karen. Uh, sorry, back onto the quotes. I can't seem to print or display my quote. Um, can you give me your number, Karen? I'll give you a call later. Is it giving you a crystal report, Sarah, by any chance? If you just put your number in the chat, I'll give you a call after we conclude the session. There's, there's normally a straightforward reason for that one. Okay, so just, okay, uh, no worries, Karen. I'll give you a shot after this. So. Okay, so the freehand quotes, uh, we use this a lot internally. I know our sales guys do because we get a lot of interest of people wanting to use Palladium. But uh, say you get 100 calls, uh, maybe only 10% of those actually convert to an order or a sale. So you don't necessarily want to create all 100 and have them as customers on the system. You might only want to create them as a customer when you get to the order level or sales invoice level. Uh, thanks for the question, Gatehold Marketing. On what occasions do I raise a credit note? Uh, so the credit note is so if you've, you've sold, you've done a sales invoice, and then for whatever reason the customer wants their money back or wants to return their goods, that's, that's when you'd process a credit note. So as I showed before, you can do it on the sales invoice screen or use the credit note here. So like I was saying, back to the, the freehand quotes, uh, so you might have 100 customers, but only five of them convert to a sale or an invoice. So you don't want 95 inactive customers for no reason. So if I go use the, the generic sales quote functionality here, you see to create this, to create a quote, we first have to select a customer. They have to be already set up on the system. So if someone phones in, you have to take the time and get some information from them, give them a customer code and whatnot. So it takes a bit more time. And you'll see this section here is grayed out, and I can't type into it. So what we tend to do, well, not specifically me, more than the sales guys, they would use a free hand quote feature. So yes, you can still create a customer that's already in the system, but I don't see the point in that, but you might as well use the sales quote feature. So what you can actually do, if you've got someone phoning in, uh, who have we got here, let's say Karen phones in and she wants a quotation. So I'm not going to create on the system yet because there's a good chance she's not going to purchase from us. Only later if she, did, if she wants to process an order or a sales invoice, we'll set her up on the system. But I don't want to keep her waiting on the phone for too long, so I'm just going to take some brief information. So maybe let's take her email address. I'm assuming Kez might be a nickname. Uh, .com, and we'll maybe take out uh, a phone number as well. So we, we can go straight into giving her a quotation. So giving her a quotation on this item. And yeah, and then we can record it. And we can email it and send it to Karen. And then if she comes back a week later or whenever, so we'll close the sales quote. And let's say Karen gets back in touch with us or one of our sales guys, as they should do, they should do a follow-up call and see if she's still interested. So on that day, she, they'll go back into the freehand quotes, they'd look for it, 
open it up, and now Karen wants to process an invoice. So it use this icon up here, transfer AR. So transfer accounts receivable. So we're going to do an invoice. And now at this stage, the system's saying, okay, now we need to set, the, set her up as a customer. And then here, we can go new and do exactly what we did before and set her up. But for this example, I'm just going to use one that's already in the system. And then it will come up with this message saying this function will transfer your quotation sales invoice. Uh, this document will be no longer available in the free quotes. And that's basically it. So it's just closing the free quote. And it's, it's straight away automatically has brought the sales invoice. And we can record it here. So that's, that's the biggest difference between the freehand quotes and the sales quotes. I mean, there is a couple of other things as well here. I'll briefly touch upon uh, Let me just go back into the one here. So what you can also do, so that the same way we just um, quoted a customer that doesn't exist, we can actually uh, quote on items that we don't actually stock yet, which aren't on the system. So maybe it's stock items we're considering uh, selling going forward. So we don't have it in stock at the moment, but we're going to just give them a quotation on it anyway. So let's say we don't stock milk, but we're considering selling it going forward. So we can quote her on it. And then again, if she does declare interest and wants to process an order, we can come back in and it will ask us to create it as an inventory item. So you don't have this flexibility on a sales quote, sales order, sales invoice. Also, what's nice on here is you can transfer it to, so I'm going to just discard this change I made. I'm going to come back in here and let's adjust it. Uh, you can convert it to a payable document. Let's come in here. I just want to come out. Uh, convert. Oh, this one's already been converted, so I can't go to an AP. So you, you can actually convert it to uh, a Accounts payable documents. So if you don't stock, if you only, so the state wants to go ahead with the order, but we don't have it in stock, we can transfer it to accounts payable. We can do a purchase order straight from the free end quote. So we've done that. So now if we want to use a general sales quote, you can see everything on the screen is pretty much the same. So we're selecting our customer, we're selecting our item, and then there's quite a lot on this screen again, really. So just to cover exactly what we see. So we, we have the flexibility of changing the quantity, changing the price. But, but this is only because I'm a system administrator and I have access rights to everything. So in most cases, you'd have a lot of users who can't change the price or can't apply a discount or uh, they can't change the salesperson. So it's, it's probably worth having a separate training session again just on the control panel and going through the user security rights. Uh, hi, Gaudi. When I make a quote, will the items be deducted from my stock? No, you, your stock won't be impacted at all. So a good way to know if anything's been impacted in the background in terms of stock or anything, you'll see up here there's, there's no green booklet up here. So if I go to a sales order or a, let's say a sales invoice, you can see here, so that means there's been some journal entries that have been processed, maybe stock's been moved. So the quotation level, nothing's happening there in terms of your stock. You're just simply quoting on it. it only, so at the sales order level, so let, let's go to a sales order. Uh, customer, so you can see there's three columns here. So we have, uh, let's, let's have a look on hand. Yeah, so you have the three columns. You have available, allocated, and on hand. So on hand is what we physically have in stock. So we can do a sales quote, and none of these three columns are affected at all. But then here, if we do a sales order for six, which looks like it's already taken place here, it will allocate that stock. And then it will update the available. So the available field is on hand minus allocated. So only when we invoice this six, this sales order, will, avail, will this on hand quantity come down. Uh, I hope that makes sense. So basically to answer your question, there's no stock implications at a quote level. You'll only see changes made at sales order. Uh, 
Yeah, so other things, like I was saying, the user security rights, some people will be able to see other things. Uh, what else is on the screen? So we've covered the department, the terms. So we set the default one, here's the one we did for uh, Darren, or Karen rather, and salesperson. So down here, a new feature on version 10 is uh, item weights. So that this is a custom development we did for a client actually. Uh, so they always have the issue that they're overloading their delivery vehicles with too much weight. So now with this feature, they can, they can run reports on total weight of their documents. So they know exactly how much weight they're putting on their delivery vehicle. So that'll be covered more in the inventory module, but that's just a general overview. Uh, So we have our discounts here, and the delivery cost again. That's the delivery fee again. That'll be covered. <clears throat> excuse me. That'll be covered in the warehousing module. Uh, at a glance, here another nice feature is I'm going to just get a second line here. So you can see here if you want to quickly see what you have on sales order or what on hand. So I've clicked on this service item here. So it's not a stock item. So down here straight away you can see. At this default location, we have zero available, zero on sales, this is a service item. So if we select this line here, we can quickly see it's a quick glance. We have 987 available, 993 on hand, and there's 1247 purchase order. So it's just it's quite handy in that regard, uh, just to see if you have the stock in, without having to go and have a look at item inquiries. If you want to get more detail, you can have a look at item inquiries here. But again, that's more on the inventory side, which we'll go through. Um, gate hold marketing. What is the difference between a sales order and a sales quote? Uh, so a sales quote, you just you're giving your customer a quotation on how much that item is going to cost or that service is going to cost. So you know you're not allocating any stock for them. You're not reserving any stock. You just give them a quotation, and then when they come and accept that quotation, maybe they say, okay, invoice me, give me the item. You can do an invoice directly. You can go from a quote to an invoice. If you're just reserving the stock and then you're going to deliver it at a later date, it allocates the stock for you. So it's allocating the stock. The sales quote, you just give them a quotation on what it's going to cost them. Nothing's been impacted. They haven't accepted or declined. So at sales order, the customer's usually giving you some indication that they want to go ahead and take it further. Uh, what else do we have on this screen? We have container items, which we'll cover in the inventory module. Uh, up here is quite handy here, so I want to select the customer a bit more history. Uh, so, yeah, so up here, at a glance, we can see account balance. We can see this customer owes us this amount. We can see there's no open orders for this customer, but there is 139 rounds sitting in open quotes. So, and you can see available credit. So what's quite nice here, we can actually see what's the source of this amount, this sum total here. So I can click here, and these are the invoices where it's coming from. So you even have the flexibility of here, you see there's a function here, email. So I can email all these outstanding invoices from this screen to the customer. And you can filter it from overdue ones only as well. So you can see the dates on these. They were due in 2015, so they're well overdue. So I certainly want to email these to the customer. It's a quite a handy feature there again. Um, again, we can attach files here. Uh, what else do we have here? Projects we'll be covering another day. Related items we'll be covering in inventory. Uh, so here, going back really to Michael's question before, the, the optional fields. So you can see here we have field seven. These ones have already been changed. So there's a drop down option here. So if I put in uh, test, so the fact that it's blank at the moment means they haven't been used before. So if I put test in here today, we'll record this document. I'm going to create a new one for the same customer, TST. Uh, I don't think it matters which customer. Yeah, it's still here. So you can see now the drop downs in effect. So it keeps your history of drop down. I'm not sure if that caters for your needs, Michael. But that's the drop down functionality. You, you, you could argue that it should be the same with the, the customers and vendors. But there might be a reason I'm not aware of it. It's not like that. 
you can add document notes here. So these will apply uh, appear at the bottom of your form, unless it's customized for it not to show. So we've done our sales order now. We can move on to a sales invoice. So the customer has said, okay, we've done the order. We've reserved stock from now, and then they finally want us to invoice it. So we can come in here. Instead of selecting the customer, yes, well, yeah, I'll come to that now, Nishan. Uh, maybe I should do it straight away before I forget. Um, so we can convert here so we can see our orders. This message just tells us that the items have zero selling prices because I don't have a price list set up at the moment. So if you have a price list set up, you, you won't be seeing this message too often. And if you do, it's a good warning to have that you don't, you're selling something at zero price. And yeah, so if we're happy, we don't want to make any changes. We, we can make changes at this screen if we want to. If we have a given the, the appropriate security rights, but if we're happy, we can just record it, email them the documents, etc., etc. Uh, so just deal. Let's go on to Nishan's query. So I'm just going to skip over here. So we have print batches uh, or email. You wanted to batch batch email. So here on this screen, you can filter all your invoices between this date range. And will it be sales or sales quotes? And so look, and you can filter. You can group it by customer. Select all, and then you can email them all out. So that, that's how you set out your batch invoicing. Is that what you meant, Nishan? Perfect. And you can see now uh, it's actually opened up my email automatically. So it hasn't brought an email address here because they don't have it set up in the master file. You can see it's, it's, it's opened up all the emails. So I can type in the email and write a message in there. Let me just close, close these. So we've done our sales invoicing. So we've done the quotes, sales orders, invoicing. Um, over here we have credit notes and credit requests. So a, a client I was at recently, uh, they wanted quite tight control on all its users. They didn't want many of their users doing credit notes without it being authorized by a senior person. So they had three branches and only one person at each branch could actually process the credit notes. All the users could do a credit request but there's no stock implications at a credit request. It's literally just that as a request. So if it's set up correctly, users who are supposed to use the credit request function shouldn't be able to see the credit notes icon. But because I'm logged in as a system administrator, I can see everything. I can do everything. So a person who has to go through the credit requests we can select the invoices. So they want to do a credit note for this one. And this shows all the lines. So for this invoice, there's only one line here. I want to do a credit note for it. So when I record this, it, it's, it's not bringing the stock back in. It hasn't done anything yet. And see, it gives me this option now. Do I want to create a credit note now? This is because I have the rights to do so. So users who don't have the rights to do a credit note won't get this option. So we're going to select no. So then this is now processed. So then now they, they all know which user in their building can authorize a credit note. So they don't have to be in their building. They might be in the head office. So they'd have to give them a notification of process the credit request. Can you please authorize it one way or another or approve it? So then the system administrator on her workstation would come here, credit notes, and then press convert. And then here they have a list of the credit requests. And they'll do their checks. They'll see, is there a credit note? Is it the right salesperson? Is the credit note being done from, from the right location? Correct price, et cetera, et cetera. And once they're happy, they can record it. And then at this stage, the stocks come back into our warehouse. Um, receipting, uh, where should I go next? So let's go to receipting. So here's the receipts icon. Uh, if we want to select a customer, let's select someone who has outstanding amounts. 
So I'll move this chat box and then I can close that. Okay, so here's the invoices that are owed from this customer. So this is the default bank account. Uh, we did touch upon that briefly yesterday, so that can be changed. It's just the default. And if we want to receipt against all of these invoices, you can simply just click over here, click of a button. I can even press the, the, drop, uh, the arrow down button, the down arrow, and just go through all the invoices. And then you record. Uh, that, that's if you know everything's been paid for in full. If you want to do it, I'm going to create to start again, and you can do it another way. So this customer owes almost one and a half thousand, but let's say they've only paid 500. So it'd come here, and you can press auto match, and it automatically pop it, completes it. So it's complete the first payment, and it's allocated the remaining against this invoice. So that's if you do auto match. If you want to do it manually, put in 500 here, and so that this is going to restrict us now. So I can't go and uh, allocate the full amount. It's limiting to us whatever we put in here. And then we record. So now when we come back in here, this customer, that first invoice was fully paid, so it no longer shows here. The second one still shows here because it only partially paid for it. Does anyone have any questions at this stage? I know I'm going over things quite quickly. We haven't got to the reports yet. Hi, Michael. Uh, can we import by Excel for cycle billing? Example, monthly set rental fee uh, plus extra services rendered for Pacific periods. Um, you, you can't import it. It has to be set up manually. Uh, so it works for you. Yeah, it has to be set manually, but plus extra services rendered. So you want to set time frame. So it's only, this is only to be invoiced for 24 months, like a phone contract type of thing. So I, I sent you that link for update two yesterday, the beta version. You'll see there's a new icon on there that's called contract billing. So we haven't been trained on it internally too much. So I'm not sure if there's an import function for it. So it's on update two, and there you can you can you can do uh, like a sample billing, but you apply 24 months, and you can set up interest. So it might increase the invoice amount might increase by 10% in July or something like that. So I also covered that feature in that YouTube video I was talking about before. So I think that might be better suited for your requirements. So I'll take a look at that as you might. Uh, it, it should have been covered in the What's New in Version 10 training last week. What was it covered? Or Not really. Okay. I think there's another What's New in Version 10 session. Uh, I'd have to check the calendar. I think there was two se separate ones set up, so I'll just make sure it is covered that time around. But the browser video I did, because it, it's basically a... a much greater version of this cycle billing. Uh, okay, uh, accounts and queries. So I usually use this quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I, I usually come, so when we get calls, we have to check if clients are on support. Uh, so I'd normally come to accounts and queries, come check here, and I'll check transactions just to see if they've been paying the support. Let's make sure they're up to date. So this just basically gives you an overview of the customer. So we can see all the information that we set up in the master file, contacts, delivery locations. You can even see the age analysis on here. And what's quite nice with all these all these reports, you can export everything into Excel. So there's an export function here. Would you like to export all the tabs or just the current one? So let's just say the current one, and I'll open up Excel. You can see it's brought in here, so we can manipulate the data and whatnot. So you can do this with inventory sales or whatever you want to do with it, and then you can manipulate it, create pivot tables, etc. Uh, open quotes, so you can see everything here. Work in progress, so that'll be covered in the manufacturing module, really. Linked customers, uh, so this is pulled through the linked customers that were shown before. That was for our head office. So we did it consolidate, so it's all shown here. 
Um, collection letters. So there's three stages to the collection letters. So we have letter to send. So this is just a polite reminder almost. Where, so we're going to select it to all of these. And as of that, these are the people who are owing. So we can select all and press send. So then as long as they have an email address, we send them a kind, a kind reminder. If it comes to the next stage now, you can send a written demand. And again, send. And then the final stage, hopefully it doesn't come to this, but then you can, you can take legal action. And then these forms are just default forms. So again, they can be customized if you want them to be. Um, I think let's, let's dive into the report, shall we? I think I'm with most company options, so let's have a look. Uh, so we have, you got most of your generic reports here, so we have customer aged, and we have all the settings here. So just the, the usual settings you'd expect to see, really. Uh, you can filter by salespeople, all customers. And then just to give you a a look at what it looks like, and it looks as such. And whenever you see the writings uh, illuminated blue like that, you, you can always, you can drill down into the source document. And if you have the user security rights, you can make an adjustment, as long as it hasn't already been receipted against. If it's been receipted against, it'll give you an error message saying the receipt needs to be reversed first. Uh, customer statements. So again, we have uh, what's also a lot of clients do love this, a nice unique selling point. Uh, here with the email, you can actually have the option. So if we just print it, run it like this, it would show as their customer statement, as you'd expect to see it. But you can see here, you can actually, it gives the option to attach invoices. So the moment set to do not attach. But you can actually attach all the individual invoices along with the customer statements to these clients. Or you might just want to send the overdue ones. So it's quite a nice, useful feature. Yeah, it is very powerful. I mean, it comes with a full audit trail, Mike. We have a good video on our YouTube channel that shows the current audit trail. And also, there's a new feature called document revision. So every document that can be adjusted, you can see what user's done it, when they've done it, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of uh, yeah, in terms of adjusting invoices, you can only do it if it hasn't been receipted against. So there's a there's a full audit trail. There's a couple of good videos on that, so you can see exactly. So you can see what reports show what. The correcting journals and all that. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's a nice feature where you can attach your your invoices. Now, I mean, I'm not going to go into all of these reports. I want to leave some time for questions. So it's. The ones which we most commonly jump into, so we have gross profit by invoice. So this shows us our margin, our GP per invoice based on our cost, etc. Again, every single report can be exported to Word, Excel, PDF, and you can email it in the same formats as well. So customer sales targets, remember there was a tab there for targets, so we can see if the sales is meeting their targets. Sales trends by customer. It's quite a nice report here, so you can see, you can, you can report where it compares last 90 days compared to previous 90 days. Uh, so you can just see if, you know, if clients aren't purchasing as much, you can target them more maybe with marketing or whatever maybe. Or if clients have completely stopped purchasing from you, you might want to contact them and find out why. Uh, other reports here, customer sales, this one, this one shows us exactly what items have been sold. So you run it by customer and by item. Items sold by a salesperson. Uh, here, this, this report will show you all invoices that have a missing salesperson. So that means if we go to the drill, if we drill down, you'll see that the salesperson is blank. So it might have been a user error, or just in this case, there was no salesperson for it. And that's when the adjustment function really comes to uh, comes in handy. So we don't do a credit note; we can just adjust it. 
uh, original invoice documents. So this this is one of our audit trails on this current version. So we can see all the adjustments made to invoices. Let's see if uh, hopefully I've made some changes. Let's go back to right now to February. Let's have a look. Let's go adjust an invoice. So let's add an item. Let's add a price here. And let's change the quantity there. February. So now in theory, when I run this report, uh, February. There we go. So here's that. Uh, so this shows us the, ori the original one. So that shows us the invoice number, the actual date, the document date. It tells you which user made the change and which customer and the original invoice total. Hey, these, this tells you which lines were amended. So that's the report. So if you do it multiple times, it'll show you every single adjustment. Uh, hi, Jan. Uh, are customer targets limited to the value of the invoice? Can, I uh, see what you mean. Can volumes of items be purchased and tracked as well? That's a good question, Jan. Um, we could probably do it. I mean, if there's any report that you see is lacking in the system, because we use the latest technology in SQL, we can we can create any custom report that you want. But um, th there's not such a report for that one at the moment, Johan. It is limited to document value at this point in time. So again, if it was something that was uh, something you really would value, uh, we we can do custom development for you and create that for you. Or if you, if you can convince our, sure, Michael, no problem. See you tomorrow. Um, you can send an email through to wishlist at Palladium. And if you can justify the value of it, because uh, our MD gets all the emails to there. Exactly, yeah, wishlist at Palladium. So you can send through all your your feature requests, basically. If you can justify the, the value and believe it will add value to the product, um, I'll send it there, because our MD actually receives them in the emails. So you're sending it straight to the top. Probably could, yeah. I've also got a reseller sitting on the training. We've also got a report that's called, uh, we, we can integrate with the Microsoft Power BI. So we can generate reports in there as well. So it's probably worth checking on there. So everyone who's attending, I'd advise that we're doing a training session. You'd have to check the calendar, actually. I'll be guessing on what day it is. I think it's in a couple of weeks' time. We've got a training session dedicated to Microsoft Power BI. So you'll be able to see what reports you can pull there as well. So I'd strongly advise pulling there because there's a mobile application so you can run reports on your phone from wherever you are as long as you've got an internet connection. And it, it's actually a free tool as well. Um, thanks for the question, Jan. Um, so reports here, open sales orders. Uh, cancelled sales orders and quotes. So this is a quite, this is another new feature on Palladium. So previously when you did sales orders and sales quotes, you'll see this icon here, remove. So previously you could just remove the document and there's no trace. But now if I do it, it says your ID will be logged as part of a transaction. And it also asks for a, a, a cancellation reason. So like when I set up one for credit notes. So this is blank because there's nothing set up at the moment. If I go to control panel, reason codes, cancellation, you can set up here. So why are we canceling these quotes? Maybe the customer's getting burned pricing elsewhere. Maybe we didn't have enough stock in the warehouse. And then, then your then managers or whoever has access to the reports can, can see where this opportunity loss is coming from. So I mean, every council quote order is a business loss, basically. So it's a very nice report to run. Uh, credit notes by reason codes, customer transactions. Yeah, so I suggest you run through these as well. Customer price lists. If you just want to export all your customers, you can do it here. Yeah, I think that, I think that pretty much concludes anything. Is there any questions I can take? We've got, I think, 50 minutes should be enough time.
Any questions, anyone? Anything you want me to recap? Because I know I went over some things quite quickly because I was quite time conscious at one stage. Cycle building. Uh, yes. Uh, so I've got Paul sitting with me. He wants me to go over the cycle building, so I'll do that. Uh, Nishan, if a person who has access yeah, removes a purchase invoice, removes a purchase invoice after doing a purchase order and a GRV, So removes a purchase invoice after doing a purchase order, a GRV. Does the removal of PI remove? It won't. No, the GRV will still be there. Uh, Johan, yeah, it'll be the same thing here. It's only looking at values. Uh, yeah, it'd only be looking at values, but we could easily create a report for that to look at quantities rather. I, wouldn't, I can't imagine it taking too long. Um, yeah, the Sean, yeah, so it only removed the, the purchase invoice. It wouldn't affect the GRV or the PO. Uh, I'm just going to go to the cycle billing, which I skipped over. So if we come in here, and we can set one up. So let's say it's for, so this is the name of the cycle billing. So let's say it's rent. Uh, maybe, and we select our items here. So maybe uh, we don't have, I was hoping I had a GL code for rent, which I don't. So maybe let's let's do another example and let's do it in marketing. So maybe, yeah, let's call it marketing. Marketing. And then, so we buy a quantity of this for six and for 50 round. So, and then you can link customers. So this can apply to multiple customers. So I can add them all in here. So these are billing items and this invoice we're going to generate for all of these customers. So they might outsource their marketing to us. Thanks, Karen. Now, well, I won't forget. I've got it written down here in my notes. I'll give you a call boy shortly after four. So once we've got this set up, I press OK. So now it's set up here. So now if you want to run this, we click on it, and we press run up here. And so it's pulled up the four customers that are linked. We press run. And you'll see it keeps opening sales invoice pages for the number of customers that we set up. And so it's automatically processed them as well. So if I now go to my invoices, you'll see it's processed that cycle going for this customer, this customer, this customer, and this customer. So that's the, that's the cycle billing, really. So we set up our cycle billing, the items, and the customers that it's relevant to. So the contract billing, which is a new feature, includes a time period, so it's over 24 months, and it caters for interest rates, uh, there's contract agreements or something. It's a new feature that isn't released yet. We haven't been trained on it fully. So I know briefly it's full, full functionality. But I did do a video on it in last year, November. I just can't recall exactly. So I'd refer to the YouTube video if you want more information on that one. Thanks, Nishan. Uh, thanks, Bryn. Thanks for coming. See you tomorrow. Any more questions, anyone? And again, the video recording will be uploaded to that Dropbox link. So you should, by this time tomorrow, you should have access to the GL training video and accounts payable. Okay, well, you might not have any questions now, but if you think of any over time, maybe after the training's con uh, concluded, you feel free to email support or myself. I'm not in the office that frequently all the time, so you can email me and CC support if I'm not in the office and anyone can answer your question. Thanks, Bianca. Thanks, Jan. See you all tomorrow. Cheers.